Welcome to Maximal Being, a podcast devoted to ditching fad diets and using real science to get you healthy and feeling great. I'm Doc Mock, a GI and functional medicine doctor who harnesses the power of gut health to get you achieving your goals. And I'm Jackie P, a well-informed layman who challenges the experts and asks the questions that you want. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button or leave a comment. And now, on to the show. What's going on, Maximal Beings? Doc Mock here with MaximalBeing.com. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, leave us a comment. It does help us to get the word out. If you have any questions, you can email us at team at MaximalBeing.com. Enjoy the episode. Hello, 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 Maximal Beings. It is I, Jackie P., your favorite layman, and I'm here with my co-hostess with the mostess, Doc Mock. How are you doing today, my friend? Jackie P, today I am feeling inspired because this is the time of year where aspiring therapeutic endoscopists, that's fancy GI doctors that do stuff like me, are applying to do what I do. And I happen to be the program director at my particular fellowship program. Um, And I am reading some of these amazing stories of trial and tribulation that people have been through and reading all the research that people have gone through in their careers. And I tell you, there there are some amazing people out there. Um, So I think it's going to be the best interview season yet. And that alone, alone, Jackie P, is, is not enough. This is also, as you know, the time in Florida where it's actually nice to be outside. So mm, love it. I am just playing outside like all day um, after work. So it, it's fantastic, Jack P. How are That's you awesome. doing? I'm doing great. You know, I cannot complain. It's leap year. I don't know why something, what about leap year? You know, we're, we're recording this. I don't know when you're listening to this, but something about the yeah. extra day, it's like a bonus day, you know? Um, I read and- about it. Yeah, I, can I jump in? Like, oh, I read absolutely! About it Please today. do. The way the reason why it was created is because of the rotation of the Earth, and if we did not do it based upon this theoretical calendar schema, eventually, uh, theoretically, Halloween would be during the summer. <laughs> so oh, wow. that is why we have leap years is due to the rotation of of the Earth on its axis. So nice. Well, I'm glad they figured that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well. Of course, Doc Mock, we're not here alone. We have, I think, I'm sure you are very excited, Doc, right? Because this I'm is so excited. Nothing gets yeah. nothing gets Doc more excited than some good microbiome talk. So with That's us, then poop. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we, how many times have we talked about poop on this podcast? I don't even know. Yes. But we have yeah. Martha Carlin, CEO and founder of the Bio Collective. Now, what is the Bio Collective? It's a microbiome research company that studied thousands of fecal samples. So she knows her poop and she knows her stuff, but you can replace that S word with the other (laughs) word if we're talking puns. But Martha, how are you today? And also, of course, thanks for joining. Well, thanks for having me. Um, Yes, I am affectionately known by my family as the poop queen. (laughs) <laughs> love it and uh i you know i proudly take on that name there is so much incredible information in that waste that we're flushing down the toilet and that really kind of sent me down a path um that has changed my life wow incredible and and i definitely don't want to do a spoiler alert folks and you know you you have a pretty good online following so there might be folks listening that know the story but for those that might not be familiar with you and your background, you know, take some time to give us a little bit of your superhero origin story. You know, I I might go on the lecture and say, hey, when you're coming up in high school and college, you didn't think, you know what, one day they're going to call me the poop queen. You know, you you look and you'll find out, you know. So talk us, you know, how did you become, you know, Martha to Martha the poop queen? Well, it's I studied actually accounting in college. So my background is in business and accounting. I came out of school and uh, went to work as an auditor. And we were trained in that process to never take anything at face value, always investigate for yourself. We were also trained on how to look at a business um, 
through a process called transaction flow review, where you do a flow chart of everything that's flowing through the business. And you're looking for those break points that could cause risk in the business. So I had a pretty good run as a uh, business person, kind of a business turnaround expert. Um, and in 2002, my 44 year old husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and seemingly healthy. He's got an old person's disease and you know, they sort of handed us some pills and are like, you know, it's progressive. There's nothing you can do. You know, here's a few books and I'm kind of a problem solver. So I looked at it and I said, I think this is a systems problem. I'm going to take my transaction flow review and start mapping things out. And so, of course, the first thing I looked at was food and water. What's going through that pipe? And I mm. started to study the science of you know, food, nutrition, agriculture, all those things that could be affecting his health. I, you know, he had been um, a marathon runner. So he was drinking, um, or, you know, the goo packets and high carb diet. And um, it, there's a lot of factors around that. He was also drinking soy protein shakes a lot, uh, kind of in the two years leading up to that. So I started looking at all these things and got very concerned about the food supply, threw all the processed food out of the house and started trying to cook, you know, cook real food mm. and, and focus on that. But in 2002, it was kind of hard to find organic food. So along that path, I continued studying science. And then um, in 2014, I read a book called Missing Microbes by Dr. Martin Blazer, uh, who showed this connection to the overuse of antibiotics in medicine and also in the food supply, I didn't really know at that time that antibiotics were used to make cows fat and chickens fat faster. Um, and so um, about six months after that, the first paper came out that showed that they could divide the two primary types of Parkinson's. One is tremor dominant. The other is posture and gait dominant. And they could actually segregate them by the bacteria in their gut. And I have said, Eureka. That's it. That's like the general ledger of the body, your gut. And uh, I quit my job. I started funding some research at the University of Chicago and uh, ended up founding uh, the Bio Collective with Dr. Jack Gilbert, who was at the University of Chicago at that time, and Dr. Suzanne Vernon, who had studied uh, chronic fatigue at the CDC for 20 years. And we said, these diseases have common elements we call them one thing, but really where the breakdown is, is in the gut microbiome. And if we start to collect samples and share them across, what we wanted to do was build a giant poop bank that we could wow. share across the planet and that researchers would look at it in different ways. And we thought they would share their data, but you know, mm. we're still not in a big sharing kind of a world, but we started to get data ourselves and some people did share with it and, and we could start to see those common elements. So we collected a lot of poop and then we started to build computational models about what was going on and trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to fix this problem and building uh, a, a bank of microbes that we could start to put back into the gut to try to fix things. Wow, that's that's incredible. And you know, you said you after you found this Eureka, you then quit your job. So you're doing all this data analysis while you're doing your day job. Yes. Wow. That is that is really cool. So uh what what was if you know roughly the timeline? Was this a matter of years, months, somewhere in between? So it was 13 years from my husband's diagnosis mm -hmm. to when I, to when I founded the bio collective and and made the connection to the gut and parkinsons so that took 13 years and I studied wow. a lot of different areas of science before finding the microbiome which honestly I think ties all of those other areas together mm, yeah i mean you're, you're you're probably singing uh singing song to Doc Mock's ears. The microbiome, right? It's 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 awesome. So when you you know when you found that aha moment, um, I mean, can can you walk us through a little bit of just 
how you like how did you decide to go from okay we found like the bacteria in the gut and like what was the step between deciding to get this huge like poop library right like what like was this something that you figured because i feel like it, you're very data minded and you can see like the system was it something like okay we just got to get data or did maybe someone recommend it you know like how did that come into play actually it was it was kind of a, a little bit crazy when i read that first paper and i i got a flip chart and in my living room, I mean, I was waking up in the middle of the night at two or three o'clock in the morning with my flip chart, drawing pictures and how do we connect all of this? And, you know, let I, I have I still have all, all of those pieces of flip charts, like let the data speak and all these wow. different pieces of the puzzle that I had been gathering over the years I'm putting on on this flip chart. And that went on for about a month. And then I actually started looking on LinkedIn for, you know, people that I might be able to connect with. And I, that's how I found Jack Gilbert and started the research at the University of Chicago. But I also reached out to Linda Avey, who was uh, one of the founders of 23andMe. And she was incredibly open. And she said, well, you know, if you're ever out in San Francisco, and I just got on a plane and flew to San Francisco and met with Linda and talked about all of her work. And, you know, she had some interest in Parkinson's and she started connecting me to people. She actually connected me to Suzanne, who was my other co-founder. And it just started having this great flow of information for about six months until you know, I finally said, okay, I'm going to start a company. And, wow. you know, that's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I can, I, I can imagine, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can you imagine. Know. Yes. Are you a healthcare practitioner searching for a comprehensive solution to streamline your patient referrals and improve collaboration with other practitioners? Look no further than Rupa Health, the ultimate platform for integrative and functional medicine practitioners. As a healthcare practitioner, I've struggled with the traditional referral process for labs. It's time consuming, inefficient, and often lacks the necessary communication between providers and patients. But ever since I started using Rupa Health, everything has changed. That's right, Rupa Health is revolutionizing the way that practitioners connect and order lab work with their patients. Their advanced platform allows you to effortlessly send and receive patient lab referrals and secure their information, sending them the kits directly. This makes the communication directly with other patients and practitioners easy to take care of. I can't stress enough how much time and energy Rupa Health has saved me. With just a few clicks, I can easily order lab work and track their progress, and then I receive the results directly into my inbox, which I can send to the patients automatically with recommendations. Absolutely, Rupa Health's extensive network of lab testing and curated, integrated, and functional medicine testing allows practitioners to receive the highest quality of care and dedicate their practice to a patient-centered, holistic approach, which aligns perfectly with the values of healthcare in a functional medicine practice. Plus, Rupa Health provides you with excellent customer support. Their team is responsive, knowledgeable, and always helps with assistance in billing questions and how kits are shipped to your patients. They are dedicated to helping practitioners like us provide the best possible care for our patients. And if you're a patient listening, it allows you to seamlessly order your lab testing and receive all of the necessary information. Rupa Health has been a game changer for my practice, and as you know, it will be for yours too. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to save on lab testing by heading to labs.rupahealth, that's R-U-P-A dot com slash store slash storefront underscore V is in victory, G is in grape, X zero zero four zero zero. That's labs.rupahealth.com backslash store backslash storefront underscore V is in victory, G is in grape, X zero zero four zero i'll see you later maximal beings i have to say you know and you definitely don't need my kudos right but like i gotta i gotta give you kudos for just like that that pursuit right something affected you and and you know because most people you know you get a diagnosis and 
you, you trust it to the medical personnel and the medical industry to, to do their thing. And you said, no, I'm going to do what I can. And now you have this company and you have a, I mean, I, there's a, I've got a lot of questions about the poop database and we'll get to that, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I just, I just want to like give you kudos to that because it's, it's not something that every folks do every day. And I think the the research of the things that I read, there are people now benefiting from you taking up that initiative so so many years ago. So I've I've got a quick I've got a few questions, a lot of questions, and Doc Mock, please butt in when you like. Um, but what would you say is something that because you, you you mentioned foods and how there's antibiotics and almost everything, right? So. The, the, the lay folks out there who aren't really privy to, to this, what would you say would be some things that we should be looking out for? Like what should be some things that, of course it's tough because it depends on where you are and locality, but what are, like what should I, you know, Jackie P or everyone should be looking for and said, hey, you know what? I can't control everything, but maybe I should cut this out or eat more of this when it comes to like your, your food integrity. Right. Well, one of the key things in food integrity that I started looking at all the way back 20 years ago was the chemicals that are used on the food and organophosphate herbicides, uh, glyphosate being the number one that I was looking at. And all the way back then, I was like, there's got to be a way that we can connect the dots to what's going on here. And the microbiome is absolutely that way because um, glyphosate is damaging will destroy about 50 percent of the gut bacteria it's mostly the good gut bacteria it also affects the gut lining it affects those bacteria that are making vitamins and all of that so i try to get people to be mindful of when they can either knowing their farmer like shop at the farmer's market and ask your farmer what have you used on this food because likely a local farmer is going to be using less chemicals than <clears throat> the large scale um, commercial agriculture. There's a section in the Central Valley of California is called Parkinson's Alley. And that's where about 50% of our produce is grown. And wow. that's where a lot of that chemical exposure goes. So be really mindful of the chemicals that are used on the food that you're eating. And now there are about 60 different crops that use glyphosate at the end of the harvest to dry the crop. So things like lentils and chickpeas and a lot of things where people think, oh, that's that's a healthy food. You have to be really mindful of, you know, like I call I called up Bob Bob's Red Mill and said, do your farmers use glyphosate to dry the oats at the end of harvest? So, you know, that- What I did think, he say? Uh, they said that they, <laughs> they, they, they do ask all of their farmers and their farmers- a test that they do not do that, but they did tell me they don't test the, they don't test for the mm. glyphosate. We've talked about glyphosates before, Jackie P. Um, you know, I lived in Cleveland, Ohio for about five, six years in practice. Uh, and there is so much glyphosate used in the state of Ohio that it is airborne. And so people like myself have had our urine samples tested and my glyphosate levels were super high. And Mark Hyman has a similar story because he's, he was based out of Cleveland at one point. Um, and just moving geographic locations can dramatically decrease your glyphosate levels. And another thing that pe people may not be thinking about is if you have, have a yard and somebody else is taking care of it, if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, you can tell those people not to use glyphosate products. And there are plenty of other products that they can utilize that are safer for the environment, for your kids, for your pets, and for you. So, so I think looking at that is also a, a very direct thing that, that people can control in addition to food. Well, that was also an interesting, we used to live near a a park that had a lot of children's play equipment and stuff. And we walked very early in the morning. We'd walk at about seven o'clock and the park crews, the, the lawn crews for the park would come in and they would be spraying uh, around the children's gym equipment. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're thinking like people are bringing their kids there later in the day and they don't know and they're touching it and getting on themselves. 
So I, I absolutely have seen cases of esophageal cancer in in gardeners, in people that are chronically using glyphosate products. And there are great funds of data that link it to various types of GI cancers for similar reasons that you've talked about. Uh, and, you know, and I don't, I'm definitely doing a little bit of a turn here, but not a turn that I just realized we've talked so much about microbiome on this podcast that we haven't really explained it. You know, there might be someone, hopefully multiple people listen to this episode and this is their first conversation or first time listening to maximal beans so maybe we should take some time to discuss the microbiome and it's just roll on our health i mean I'll, of course like its impact on neurodegenerative diseases but i mean almost everything else so i mean i'll 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 you know dealer's choice you know if 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 martha you want to take crack at doc mock if you want to nerd out for a while but let's take some time and just break down the microbiome and so for the you know, for the first timers can catch up. Sure. I actually I was just working on a slide presentation today where I, the first two slides are what is the microbiome? And it's it's roughly about it, so it's the trillions of microbes that live in and on our body. And I tell people they function as our internal ph pharmacy to maintain our health. It weighs about four pounds. There's about roughly about two times as many uh, microbial cells as human cells. Um, and it's making vitamins, hormones, neurotransmitters. So those microbes are es essentially the key workers in the factory of our body that is breaking down our food, providing nutrients to us and uh, making those hormones and new neurotransmitters. So controlling our mood. I mean, they're really involved. They're also involved in training the immune system. So 70% of our immune system is in the gut and that early training uh, occurs uh, when babies are breastfed preferentially. Um, so that's kind of an a overview. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a classical example of a symbiotic relationship. So you hear it in Hollywood and rom-coms, but that could be the, the best example in nature I can think of is, you know, you see an alligator in Florida sitting in a pond and there's a bird sitting on its back. And that, that alligator is not eating that bird because the bird is symbiotic to it and serving a purpose for that alligator in its cleaning its back of various parasites and insects and things like that that can harm that alligator. And the alligator is serving as protection because who's going to climb over an alligator to get to a bird? So, <laughs> so it's a symbiotic relationship. And, and it's existed since the dawn of time. Um, we, you know, part of our cellular structure, the mitochondria is synonymous from a, like a genetic perspective, if you analyze the genes of our mitochondria, it is the same as rhizopa bacteria. And so we've kind of coexisted with this microbiome, although it's not just bacteria, it's yeast and fungi and all these things, right? For, for since we've existed as the human race. Oh, great. Wow. I, you know, I don't know how many, it's been a while. I just like, I just love watching Doc Mock go into a zone. His eyes kind of glaze over and that brain just takes over. He just kind of talks. Yeah. But yeah. Can, wonderful. I, can I say one more thing? Oh, please yeah. do. So, so you mentioned this, Martha, that, you know, it it's in and on us. I think most people think of the microbiome. They think of the gut microbiome and that's like all I talk about, but we have microbiomes like everywhere, right? We have them on our eyes, on our skin, in our lungs, uh, in our reproductive organs, you know, so it's everywhere in the environment, in and on us, not just the gut microbiome. And the composition is variable. And there's really Back some you, great research going on in the skin microbiome and the importance of that, because we're now in this kind of hyper clean environment where we've lost a lot of those microbes that were performing functions on our skin also. Yeah, we did a, an episode with a scientist who looked at vesic vesicles in the skin microbiome and the link between that and, and uh, acne vulgaris. So listen back to that episode if you haven't done so already, listeners out there. Are you looking for high quality evidence-based supplements to support your functional medicine practice? Look no further than Fullscript. 
the leading platform for healthcare practitioners to prescribe and order professional grade supplements. As a functional medicine and gastroenterology doctor, I trust Fullscript to provide me with a wide range of high quality supplements that meet specific needs of my patients. Their extensive product catalog includes trusted brands, ensuring that I have access to the best options for my patient's health. That's right, Fullscript offers a comprehensive selection of supplements, including vitamins, minerals, botanicals, and specialty formulations, all sourced from reputable manufacturers. Plus, their rigorous quality control ensures that you're getting products that meet the highest quality standards of purity and potency. And what I love most about Fullscript is the convenience it offers. With their user-friendly online platform, I can easily browse, prescribe, and manage supplement protocols for my patients. It saves me valuable time and streamlines the ordering process. Absolutely, Fullscript makes it easy to create customized protocols for your patients and track their progress. Plus, they handle all the logistics from inventory management to shipping, so you can focus on what matters most, providing excellent care to your patients. So if you're ready to take your functional medicine practice or wellness to the next level, visit us.fullscript.com slash welcome slash maximal being. That's us.fullscript.com slash welcome slash maximal being to receive your 15% discount on customized supplements and check maximal being standardized protocols for gut health. Fullscript has been a game changer for my practice and I know it will be for yours. Don't miss out on this incredible resource for functional medicine practitioners and patients alike today. Okay, so... The folks are caught up. We know about the microbiome. And let's talk about, let's talk about the poop. I want to talk about the poop. You know, it, it just, it just, it's fascinating to me. So uh, I remember seeing somewhere on your website where we talked about like learning about just our collective health. And I came up with this word and I don't know if it's the correct word, like way, but like we have our microbiomes, but would it be considered a macrobiome? if we're like looking at the overall health of a population based on, you know, this data from your fecal library? Well, I, I, I like, I like that. that new term. That's, I, I, I've not heard that, but it is, uh, you are looking a, a layer up at that macro level and you could go to even planetary macro levels and, and uh, sort of layer that down. So yeah, I like that. Awesome. So what what would you say has been a few, I guess, maybe aha moments or just interesting findings when you looked at, you know, at a macro level of, you know, the, the, the fecal library? Like, has there been anything that you've learned, like, based on, like, population? I'm not too sure how you sort it or track it, but. Well, of course, Parkinson's is one of my reasons for doing this in the first place. So we we did have a larger set of people with Parkinson's in our data set. So the process of collecting the stool samples, we developed these a kit that we would send to somebody's home. It had this nice little hammock that sat on the toilet. You could collect it in an ick free way. You just picked up the little hammock and dropped it in a bag and put it in with your ice brick and mailed it to us. And then in our laboratory, we would do a homogenization process and an aliquoting of into little tubes so that they would be available for these other scientists. Well, the uh, young people in our lab who were processing the samples after a period of time one of them came to me and she said, you know, um, I can tell that someone has Parkinson's but just by looking at their sample without knowing that they have Parkinson's. Whoa. And I see the sample, I know it's a Parkinson's sample. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I can't process it the way I process the other samples. So the other ones would go into a syringe, you know, a large scale syringe, and you could squirt it out. Um, but the Parkinson's sa uh, samples were like concrete. Oh, wow. So they had sections that were like concrete, and they actually had to use a caulk gun. So I started looking <laughs> through the literature um, because I also knew like chronic constipation can precede a diagnosis of Parkinson's by 10 to 15 years. 
Um, so I'm looking through all the literature to see if there's anything about fecal water content or dehydration or, you know, what's going on with the water and nothing published at all. So that was like a huge kind of aha for me is like, you can tell from the stool and that sent me really looking at the Bristol stool score. So if your viewers know what that is, I'm sure, um, you know, you want to be in that three to four range, but in the European uh, human microbiome project, they did a large scale project like the U S did. Um, they actually showed that the Bristol stool score was in the top 10 things of, they measured something like a thousand different things in the top 10 things of predict predicting your health was your Bristol stool sc score and your stool that you were consistently going on a daily basis. So Martha, I'm going to have to pull a flag on you here because some folks may not know what that score means. So we got to, you're, you're getting expert, you know, okay. you're showing off that big old brain of yours. All right. So walk the, walk the folks, walk me through what that Bristol score is. Um, so, so the, we could keep the up. Bristol, yeah, the Bristol stools. And actually, after being in the poop business for as long as we, we <laughs> did determine that the Bristol stool score does not have enough numbers because <laughs> oh. it yeah. goes from number one to number seven. And I'm hoping I'm getting this right. But so you go from a very liquid stool to a very solid pellets, concrete and in the middle is kind of like, you know, smooth peanut butter or, mm. you know, something that you're easily passing. So you go from blowing it out to very hard to get out to in the middle is where you want to be, which is nice and easy, comes out smooth. And um, they use that as a measure of, of uh, kind of looking at general stool health. And I'm sure that Doc Mock can probably elaborate on <laughs> yes uh and we use it in clinical practice we use it in gastroenterology re research and so score of one is the little poop pellets and score of seven is just a just a puddle of water essentially um it, it does correlate with multiple different diseases it, it kind of lends objectivity to uh, something that's very subjective and an example of that is how people describe diarrhea which can be more liquidy, more frequent, inability to control it, it can be continence issues. Um, it's all over the map. So, so lending a little more objectivity to something that seems so simple as a number two, right? Yeah. It is really useful for scientific literature. Um, we may be jumping ahead a little bit, Martha, but you talked about the viscosity of the stool. And I was doing a little bit of research in preparation for today and it's hard to make the jump from Parkinson's and gut health, right? Like where, where is the connection there? We've talked about the vagus nerve. That seems like that's the highway, but you're talking about how constipation can kind of predate Parkinson's. And what I found in my research, and correct me if you found anything to the contrary, is that years prior to a diagnosis, if you were to look at the enteric nervous system, so the gut's nervous system and biopsy in people with Parkinson's, they have inflammation that occurs. And as a result of the inflammation, they generate Lewy bodies. So al alpha uh, synuclein, right? And alpha synuclein is the same thing that we find in the brains of people with Parkinsonism. And so the thought is that the, this chronic inflammation due to disruptions in the gut microbiome causes these proteins, these Lewy bodies to form, which kind of shuttle up the highway, the vagus nerve up to the brain, and therefore it can cause Parkinsonism, which I just thought was absolutely fascinating. Do you, do you agree with that or? Yes, it, it is. Add to that. So as it turns out also alpha synuclein, which is that protein that's aggregating and beta amyloid in Alzheimer's, uh, both of those are antimicrobial peptides. So that's something that's more recently discovered as well. But, and there are over 500 papers using uh, a mouse model 
to induce, they get a mouse and they give the mouse Parkinson-like symptoms. And it's called the LPS-induced Parkinson's model. Well, LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide, and that is the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. And as it, it turns out, not only Parkinson's, there's a number of animal models using gram-negative bacteria cell wall endotoxin to induce these symptom profiles. And so you get inflammation in the gut, you get a leaky gut barrier, it's crossing over and those, um, you know, the endotoxins are causing inflammation throughout. And then you're also getting this uh, aggregation that's trying to solve the problem, I think. Um, but they, there have been some interesting papers in the last couple of years showing that traveling up the vagus nerve to the the brain. And there's, um, there's also uh, Brock's hypothesis. I think uh, now they think it can either come through the nose so you can breathe it in or come through the mouth or both. And there's a slightly different presentation of, of what they're finding in the microbes, mm. whether it came through the nose or the mouth first. Wow. Fascinating. The content included is not intended to be used as medical advice, and viewers should consult their physician or healthcare provider should they have additional questions. The viewers should not rely on information contained in these presentations for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you have a medical emergency, call your physician or go to the emergency department or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or rely on seeking medical care or delay medical care due to information contained in this presentation. What's going on, Maximal Beings? Doc Mock here. If you haven't done so already, leave us a comment and hit the subscribe button. Let your friends and family know. That way we can get the word out and continue to bash the bro science.